You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hi, hello and welcome to Digging Up Ancient Aliens. This is the podcast where we examine strange claims about alternative history and ancient aliens in popular media. There are claims of what to do an archaeologist are the better explanations out there. We are now on episode 54. I am Frederick, your guide into the world of pseudo archaeology. This time we return to Ganang Padang, a site that we have visited some time before but have not really revisited since the infamous paper was released in 2023. A few months have passed since, upon this release at least, and maybe it's time to review the subject. Since we are still doing the ancient alien top 10 pyramids, we also have the opportunity to compare the ancient alien theory with the Atlantis hyperdiffusion theory. It is not often we have the chance to compare two alternative history narratives side by side like this. Also, what does Megan Fox have to do with any of this? While you sit on the edge of your seat, it is maybe time to start all of this. But if you want to learn more about the topics I talked about and where I get everything from, well, check out the episode page to learn more about the sources used for this episode. You'll find that on diggingupancientaliens.com. A megalithic thank you to all patrons and members of this show, like Philip, for example, who, um, with their money, support this show, and the Patreon bonus episode should have dropped by now, focusing on Chariots of the Gods by Van Daniken. And if you want to learn how to support the show with money, I will tell you all about that later. If you don't want to support it with money, but do something, well, leave a five-star review anywhere you can, and that's incredible helpful too. Now that we have finished with our preparation, let's dig into the episode. Welcome to Indonesia and a site that we visited almost a year ago, Ganung Padang. It is a site that's recently become quite uh, famous or maybe infamous due to a study and a pseudo documentary over at Netflix. Of course, I talk about uh, ancient apocalypse. We investigated um, this series over four episodes, and if you miss them, they are episode 30 through episode 33. So this allows us to compare the narratives between ancient aliens and Graham Hancock. While Hancock have um, been in the past a frequent guest on Ancient Aliens, he has uh, since focused more on promoting his white culture bearers from Atlantis and promoting a more esoteric version of alien intervention. Graham isn't really ruling out alien communication. It is just more, um, let's say, a spiritual connection that he is uh, proposing that the alien have to us mere humans. So let's see how ancient aliens set the tone for Gunung Padang. Western Java, Indonesia, 2013. The Indonesian government sponsors an excavation to explore what might be hidden beneath the layers of dirt and rubble at a site known as Gunung Padang, or Mountain of Light. They uncover incredible evidence, revealing a 300-foot-tall step pyramid dating back at least 10,000 years. They base most of this segment on what Graham Hancock wrote in the 2015 book Magicians of the Gods. How I come to know this is due to the use of the translation Mountain of Light. So far, I've only seen Hancock translating the hill, well, this this way, basically. In the book and in Ancient Apocalypse, Graham Hancock claims that, quote, Ganang Padang. The name it still goes by today, often mistranslated as a mountain field by those unaware that the language of this area is not Indonesian, but uh, Sundanese, in which Ganang Padang means mountain of light, or 
Mountain of Enlightenment. The issue with this statement is that it's simply really not true. While enlightenment can be a bit more complex to translate as it carries a deep philosophical and spiritual connotation, a close translation might be penserahan, which conveys the sense of illumination or enlightenment in an intellectual or spiritual sense. And if we would translate it to mountain of light, we would instead use uh, the word kahayahan. And I don't find any synonyms that are even similar to the word padang. The closest meaning I can find is field. And this is corroborated by a Sundanese translator and double checking the available Sundanese dictionaries. While it's a petty thing to linger on, this is not really a home run for either Ancient Aliens or Graham Hancock in the, well, fact department. While Hancock does not bring up the fact that a nationalistic government sponsored this excavation in his pseudo-documentary, it's interesting that ancient aliens kind of did. Back in 2019, the Ancient Alien Show claimed the excavation started in 2011. Remember that we are working from a compilation show, which is closer to the truth than many other alternative history narratives out there. However, Graham Hancock discusses how the excavation was funded and approved in the book Magicians of the Gods. But the narrative there is also slightly off compared to the actual timeline. Now, the excavation project started in 2011 so ancient aliens previous episode was correct on this and it was initiated by the then sitting government the investigation group was called the integrated and independent research team or short TTRM and it's what I will use going forward here to save me some time and it was led by Andy Arief, special staff to the president, and this is a position that's a sort of advisory position within the in Indonesian government and is supposed to give, um, or well, these special staffs are supposed to give uh, targeted and specific advice on different issues to the sitting president. So from the start, this project started on the orders of the current government. As uh, Solis Giovati and Fo point out in a paper, this was part uh, of a strategy to redefine the nationalistic idea and create a new national monument founded on, well, a previous advanced civilization. I go into deeper <laughs> depth on this uh, part in the ancient apocalypse uh, breakdown if you're interested to learn more about this uh, nationalistic aspect of the project. And we see a similar concept in Bosnia, for example. Uh, on top of having the government involved from the start, it might be good to mention that they also had Ali Akbar, who was the, or is maybe, deputy chair of the national team for archaeology. All of this makes Hancock's claim in his book that this project was in uh, danger of being suppressed a bit off, and I'm going to quote here from Hancock's book. When I ask what he means by obstacles, he replies that some senior Indonesian archaeologists are lobbying the government in Jakarta to prevent him from doing any further work at Gunung Padang on the grounds that they know that the site is less than 3,000 years old and see no justification for disturbing it. The protest was, of course, voiced from the start of the project from, well, basically its, its conception because it was based on a non-scientific idea. It was based on proving a pseudo-scientific claim that the site was part of some ancient super-civilization. Some within the Indonesian government did question the excavation back in early 2013 publicly. Prasti, one of uh, those who criticized the project, wrote, quote, Three departments, the Department of Education and Culture, Ministry of Research, Technology and Higher Education, and the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources, 
which state that there are no indications of any structure within Mount Padang were met with accusations that D3's ministers manipulated the research report of the Gunung Padang site. So we have three independent reports from three different government bodies in combination with the criticisms from archaeologists, geologists and volcanologists explaining what we see at Gunung Padang isn't extraordinary. There is an archaeological site there. But it's not a sign of a 20 or 10,000 year old pyramid. Associate Professor of Geology Callan Bentley has a great article that simply explains how these uh, columns we see at Ganong Padang's form due to cooling fronts. And it's these columns that some has misinterpreted as evidence of human interference that was the basis for the excavation and the claim that this is a giant human-built pyramid. And people misinterpreting things in nature as human-made is, well, isn't really strange. I mean, go out on an archaeological field school excavation with students who have never really excavated in the past. You will hear, I found something every every second second, while in reality they just found another nice rock. I mean, I've been there and when you start to look for patterns or signs of human interference, your brain will start to help or maybe, (laughs) well, uh, put you in some trouble because it will find those patterns for you even if they aren't really there. But the columnar joints found in the position they are on top of an old volcano isn't really strange nor surprising to professionals within the field. So after Andy Arief dismissed the reports from the ministers, he confirmed that the excavation would continue and be expanded in 2013 no matter what. And the early part of the project and its excavation are documented by Ali Akbar in a book published in 2013 and also in an unpublished article from Danny Natavijaya in 2014. The later report also included images from the excavation that confirm that the project was excavation at this stage and was of a pretty decent size. The funding at this stage is not really disclosed or I haven't been able to find any exact numbers on it. However, since the project was part of a government task force, I can assume it was not insignificant with the workforce and equipment we see on the pictures. Then, in 2014, the project was granted a blank check. This was on order from the then-sitting president, a decision Hancock in Magicians of the Gods paint as something positive, of course. I guess he left his follow-the-money journalism days back in the 1980s. Let's follow the money and find out. The book claims that the excavation started in 2014, which is, again, as we have seen, wrong. It's not great when you're out journalisted by an archaeologist, to be honest, Hancock. And at the start of the second stage of this project, Natavijaya and the TTRM team received uh, about $250,000 as initial seed funding. And it's unclear how much they have received in total. Of course, this came to a cost on other real archaeological sites and even geological surveys and monitoring of volcanoes in Indonesia. When the Volcano and Geological Hazard Mitigation Center, PVMBG, is uh, underfunded while a group digging up an old volcano looking for Atlantis has unlimited funds, well, something has um, gone horribly Horribly wrong. I mean, I think you would like to prioritize volcano monitoring over finding Atlantis. But maybe that's just me. (laughs) Now, while on the subject, I assume we have to talk a little bit about the recently published paper about the site. Geo-archaeological prospecting of Ganang Padang buried prehistoric pyramid in West Java, Indonesia. Was published in October 2023 and received much, much unfortunate media attention. Some good news regarding this paper is that the journal has started investigating the paper. Unfortunately, it's a bit tad too late. 
The data within, however, might even be more disappointing because it is the exact same data and conclusion I debunked last spring is the same data Rebecca Bradley could disprove in 2017 and exact C14 dates Carl Fagan questioned in August last year. Nata Vijayai had put these samples on a poster for a conference back in 2017. That seven years of excavation and research with basically unlimited funds only resulted in 13 C14 samples, which many are from core samples and some core samples that don't don't really have an exact position within the site is strange. Even worse is that all samples are from unknown organic materials. No material culture at the site support these old dates. But this hasn't stopped the team from randomly dating the culture layers. Now, when using C14 to date something, we need to know what it was, what it is we're dating and what this was part of. When employing carbon-14, C14 dating, it's crucial to understand not just what we are dating, but also its historical context. And this is especially true for organic materials, which can naturally relocate without really human involvement in this. Simply determining the age from an object tells us when it ceased being part of a living entity. For instance, Uncovering wooden planks in an archaeological dig within a town might suggest that these are remnants of the building's flooring or maybe a nearby pathway. However, finding a stray piece of wood or car coal in a test pit in an open field doesn't necessarily indicate any human activity was involved within it. And such samples could originate from natural events like forest fires or just fragments of fallen branches. Understanding the context is critical in distinguishing between artifacts of human life and mere natural occurrence. Something that the team led by Nata Vijayai didn't really do in their C14 dating. So, this paper failed to support the author's conclusion that this is a 20,000 year old pyramid. Reading the paper, it becomes evident that they are not really using the scientific process. They start the whole project with the conclusion that the Ganang Padang is an ancient pyramid built over 10,000 years ago. Again, this is something you will notice if you read Natavijaya's 2013 book, Plato Never Lied, Atlantis is in Indonesia, or any of Ali Akbar's books on this topic. All predate the official excavation and were written during the TTRM's project's early stage. The team is not looking at the site from a neutral perspective, but trying to find evidence for their conclusion really no matter what here. For example, a half cent from the Netherlands East Indies minted somewhere between 1914 and 1949 became when found by this excavation team, a 5,200-year-old amulet. How they came to this conclusion is unclear, especially since it was found in a layer that they themselves claim was dated to 10,000 BCE. But again, they didn't go to a numismatic expert, that's an expert who deal in coin, and asked what they believed this could be. No, they decided that this was too old to be modern, just because they want to find something that's too old to be modern. So while media, Nata Vijaya, Graham Hancock and others have celebrated this paper as evidence for a lost Atlantean civilization, they do this solely based on confirmation bias. As we have seen, this has not been a scientific endeavor. And the carbon-14 dates are, as Carl Fagan and Rebecca Bradley point out, things we would expect if we're dating an organic sequence in a volcano. As I discussed in episode 31, the mountain is not challenging for a volcanologist or a geologist focusing on this type of um, geological feature and uh, expertise in this field. To explain, Nata Vijaya, Akbar, and Hancock have yet to explain how the site can't be a natural volcano. Now, after the break, we will look at the younger Dryas hypothesis. Does it hold up to scientific scrutiny, or is it just wishful thinking from its proponents? 
Welcome back. When we compare the narratives between the Atlantean and the alien camp, things get even more mesmerizing. We have a weird situation where they twist the narrative slightly from each other's pseudo histories here. While we are used to um, this as something they do to scientists, we haven't really seen them do this to themselves in the past. According to geologists, 20,000 years ago, this area of Java was not an isolated island, but the southernmost part of a subcontinent known as Sundaland. This has led some researchers to speculate that Ganong Padang, with its high elevation, could have been at the pinnacle of a civilization that disappeared sometime around 10,000 BC. When melting ice caps flooded the region, and turned it into the series of islands it is today. But if true, just who was this mysterious culture capable of building a 300-foot tall pyramid? Most of this resemble the narrative we heard in places like Ancient Apocalypse. Large part of this section built on a, as I mentioned, previous episode from season 13, aired in 2019. Uh, the large flood myths are not as driving in the ancient astronaut idea compared to the Atlantean hyperdiffusion theory. They are still a component in the larger ancient alien mythology. But then it's not due to a natural disaster or an act of nature that change uh, human uh, living condition. No, it's a deliberate plan by the alien overlords to call the human population. And in 2019 they had Megan Fox. Yeah, that Megan Fox, the Transformer actress. So just from heaven, what? What are you, like an alien or something? Who discussed the connection between aliens and the younger Dryas impact speculation. And the theory that I gravitate to the most is just that there was a, a pre-flood advanced civilization that was almost entirely eradicated at some point. And the idea of that being connected to the younger Dryas, because there do seem to be a lot of these megalithic structures that were erected around the same time like you have robert shock who's dated the sphinx i think to 12,000 years ago and we have gobekli tepe which turned everything on its head then we also have um praveen mohan uh ancient alien proponent who will uh, actually speak on the cosmic summit apparently <laughs> so i think we can start to expect that there will be a closure connection between them Atlantis uh, hyper diffusion theory and the uh, ancient alien narrative going forward. As for the younger Dryas impact hypothesis, as it's often known among its proponents, this idea has been reasonably disproven or quite thoroughly disproven if we should be honest for a deeper understanding of this i'd recommend going through the paper comprehensive refutation of the younger dryas impact hypothesis it's written by vance holidays among others including mark boslow who um, is a frequent poster in the facebook group fraudulent archaeology wall of shame i will give you the Short version here on why the YDI hoax is problematic and most likely not true. And again, most of these are lifted from Vance Holiday's uh, paper. Firstly, it seems like some people are attempting to find solutions to problems that may not require any solutions at all. The fact that a cooling period coincide with the conclusion of a archaeological era does not necessarily imply a connection between those two. There could be other causes for the last interglacial transition and the end of Clovis that are not related to a natural global disaster. Secondly, we see flawed evidence supporting their idea. Dates for suggested YDIH sites lack proper dating and those who have been dated have used criticized methods that are prone to errors. Also, purported impact uh, indicators are questioned for their association with impacts and conflicting scenarios. And those few sites with accurate dating don't show any high levels of these indicators that is 
would be an impact site. They have also been unable to truly rule out natural non-impact explanation for several of the features they claim support this idea. And then we have the lack of terrestrial consequences. We don't see the effect in the records for an event of this magnitude so close in time. They also fail to meet standard scientific criteria and uh, others in academia. And Holiday et al. have raised several concerns about inaccuracies within these studies. In a nutshell, YDIH have uh, significant problems, including weak evidence and methodological issues. As I mentioned, and if you want a deeper understanding of the issues with the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, I strongly recommend going through this study because it will give you a much clearer picture of what's going on and what the criticism of this theory really is. So if ancient aliens are not suggesting that Gunung Padang was built by Atlanteans, trying to warn us of uh, an impending meteor strike, what are they suggesting then? In Indonesian star lore, there's a constellation of particular interest. They call it Bindung Biduk. We call it Ursa Major. It is thought that it is the shape of a boat and that the original craft, the original star ship carrying the people came from this place to their land. Their houses, the long houses, the community structures are built in the shape of a boat, always facing northward in honor of the place of their origins. These star travelers are said to have started the original royal family. The name of the people, Taraja, means those who come from the stars. So what we get is the classic ancient alien trope, that the local myth that incorporate gods or the sky means they had alien contact. Here we see something ancient aliens and Atlantean hyperdiffusion proponents have in common, culture dismissal. Both camps imply that ancient people of our past could not have um, imagination or symbolic thought. This approach to myth really minimized the creativity of ancient people. They also dismissed this way that uh, these myths can contain a rich symbolic and metaphorical layer. And this approach to myth also ignores humanity's skyward wonder. We, as a species, have since the dawn of time being fascinated with the sky and celestial bodies. One could almost say that this is part of the human experience because it's not unique to a particular culture, location or period that our ancestors attribute divine qualities to phenomena in the sky is not strange. It's part of the human tendency to mythologize the unknown. We, as a species, don't really do well with things we don't understand. Attributing the divine properties this way become a way to explain and relate to the world they live in. This doesn't necessarily have to indicate alien contact or Atlantean culture bearers. Reducing complex mythologies to simple explanation like the aliens did it or the white guys from Atlantis did it ignores the depth and diversity of these stories. Myths are rarely meant to explain one thing. They often include several different aspects, including morals, explanation for natural phenomena, and a recording of historical event in a non-literal sense. So reducing these myths to mere description of alien or Atlantean encounters truly dismiss the myth educational, psychological and educational value. Then we have the issue that they mix mythology and language. Vendum Vidak is not a word or a term I can locate in the Toraya language or any academic text available in numerous different databases. Not even Jim Bob's alien blog mentions Vendum Vidak. The only other occurrence is transcripts of two ancient alien episodes. In Javanese, however, the constellation is known as uh, Lintang Yong or the boat constellation. Now, there isn't really a doubt that the constellation is important within the Toraya society. Ursa Major is vital in 
funerary rites. As uh, Hetty Novi Palm puts it, quote, the soul then takes his or her place in either Ursa Major or Pleiades. Star clusters of importance in rice cultivation. Rice is considered as more or less under their protection. We can learn this from the Toraya verse uh, Chant for the Deceased in uh, Van der Wien's uh, 1966 translation, section 1b, verse 125. It reads, and I'm truly sorry if there's any Toraya speakers out there. I, I did my best regarding pronunciations, but Manda Natakaya Lemba Nasuluku Bugalanlan Napun Mekidi Kidi. Translated, this means something like The great bear hold him in its arm. The Pleiades clasp him to them. The shining stars encompass him. Note the absence of Vendum Vidak in this verse. Here, Lamba refer to the Ursa Major constellation and to reference uh, Novi Palm's analysis of the text, we find the signs portraying to the rice agriculture season. Bungalalan is connected to the Pleiades. Its literal meaning is um, the one who prepares the way or the opener. This constellation appears at the start of the rice cultivation season, leading the Toraya to conduct a ritual that marks the beginning of the planting season. Palm further explains the significance of this sign, noting that it symbolizes the ancestors watching over their descendants, since this is the place where the soul goes to in the afterlife, if, of course, the proper rituals are conducted before burial. This way, descendants pray to their ancestors, hoping for their assistance in the afterlife to ensure a bountiful rice harvest. After the break, we will look closer at the Toraya people and their houses and see if the ancient aliens might have been involved. But as we have seen so far, the real history is far more interesting. Now, if you remember back to the quote we heard previous, there is a mistranslation of the meaning of the name Toraya. In ancient alien circles, it's often believed to mean those who come from the stars, but it's not entirely accurate. While the Indonesian word Raja means king or prince, you only get to the star people origin if you combine the translation with a myth about gods descending from the sky. However, this translation does not accurately reflect the native meaning of the world. A more accurate translation of Taraya in the Indonesian language would be more or less the land of heavenly kings or something like that. However, if you look closely at the word Toraha, we can see that it's made up by two words, Tu and Raha. According to Novi Palms, a closer translation would be people of high status, people whom others esteem or whom others deem worthy. This translation, however, is not based on the Taraha people's language. If we look at the name through their eyes instead, it comes from Tori Aha which translates to people of the uplands. This is similar to the phrase uh, tolu, which translates to people of the sea and provides insight to uh, the Taraha people's relationship to their environment. So the people that we are discussing, they are living inlands uphill and they, when they speak about those living close to the sea, they refer to those uh, as uh, tolu. And the Toraha mythology is deep and complex and as usual sources and information can be found on the episode page if you want to dive deeper into this. Before moving on however, I want to touch on the Tonkonan houses or as the quote put it, to the boat shaped houses. They are quite clearly boat shaped, that's not really something to argue with, but this is not to imitate a spaceship as we heard before. Again, this is a clear example on how ancient alien theory is a reductionist towards indigenous mythology. Waterson writes about the Taraha, quote, Here too we find a richly imaginative body of stories in which myth 
genealogy and history are woven together, always bound up with landscape and the house. It is not wrong to view the Tonkonan as a place of remembrance, a place that's deeply connected to the family, the history and the genealogy. So the Tonkonan is uh, not just a house where you live, it's a fundamental spot for the family gathering and even community events, including social and religious gatherings. The name Tonkonan comes from the verb Tonkon, meaning to sit, again highlighting the house's role as a gathering place. And each of the Tonkonans represent one family, and they come in different sizes, and each one carries an individual name. Just as some here in the west name their cars, the Taraha name their house. And these houses are essential to upkeep and often a rice field or a palm grow is connected to the house to support repairs and the community feasts. Something I found interesting is that the house are inherited through the maternal lineage. When a couple marries, the man moves to the woman. And in case of a divorce, the man is not allowed to take things from the Tonkonan or, you know, take over the house and decide that he is now the owner and the person who lives there. What the former husband can take, however, is um, the rice silo out back. That's a structure not connected to the main house and therefore he can take it and use that to start his new life, so to say. And when a child is born, the placenta is also buried on the western side of the house. Again, anchoring the house itself with genealogy, history, family and the maternal side of uh, the lineage. And the house itself is supposed to be more modeled after the god Puang Matua's construction. At first, Puang Matua built a simple house, just as the first people that lived on earth, but he built his up in the sky, of course. And this simple hut was described to have four poles carrying up the roof and is basically referred to as the navel, the navel of the house, and is still used in the early construction of the Tonkonan. But then he... Well, evolved building a house with iron pillars that would never decay and use them in the center of the house. While it might be tempting to connect iron and sky with aliens or Nazi moon people. If you haven't seen Iron Skies, it's a movie I recommend. (laughs) We are that way forgetting all the other stuff associated with the legend itself. Remember that the Tonkonan is inherited through generation. It's not supposed to be temporary. It's eternal. Describing Puang Matua's house as having iron pillars is not attempting to to describe a spaceship because even the divine Puang Matua's uh, Tonkonan or the rest of the building is made out of wood. It has iron pillars to create a sound and eternal foundation and all of that. It's more to reinforce the eternity of the family in that sense, than to describe alien uh, spacecraft. And the Toraya builder houses standing north to south. And again, it can be connected with their mythological worldview. It's also worth mentioning here that Puang Matua made his house stand east to west following the sun's past. But in the Toraya culture, it's Pemali or forbidden to construct your Tonkonan in this direction down on earth. Again, this simplifies the mythology to a point where you lose a large part that can explain the context of this. Yeah, they, they build a house pointing north because that's where the alien came from in the sky. Not really. It's because it's forbidden to build it the other direction. Then we have the last nail in the coffin. Toraya's land on the, is on the Sulawesi island and Gunung Padang is on Java, close to the city of Jakarta. There are some 1,300 kilometers between these two islands, and it's hard to really understand how they connect to Raya people with Gunung Padang. So if you don't want to accuse the ancient alien people of cherry picking before, well, maybe this is the time, because they only select the Troya people because they have a mythology that they can rewrite to fit their preferred narrative, leaving out all the other cultures, peoples, mythology living on the island uh, Java itself because they don't fit their narrative. Therefore, they doesn't count. So 
if Phnom Penh is not the world's largest or oldest pyramid built by either white Atlanteans or aliens, what is it then? The earliest known account of the site and its enclosure can be traced back to an account by Roger Verbeck in 1891. Later, it can also be found in a report by a Dutch archaeologist, Niklas Johannes Krom, in 1915. Krom describes the site as a place with four enclosures and he claims it has a funerary function. Worth mention is that since then no burials or cemeteries have been found at the site. And it would have become almost forgotten if it had not been for three locals rediscovering the site in 1979. The enclosures we see at the site today are believed to be Punden Berendak, a term from the local language translating more or less to glorified person. These megalithic structures scatter, are scattered across the West Java and resemble a small step pyramid in layered platform, each level a stage for ancestral worship. The tradition of building Pundenberundak flourished between the Paleometallic period, a time frame stretching from 500 BCE to 500 CE, marking the Indomalayan Bronze Iron Age. Kanung Padang isn't just another structure in this tradition, it is unique. It incorporated a natural 885 meter tall hill, making it the largest of its kind. Other examples like Lebak Sebdung and Arca de Mas share their architectural DNA, but not really this type of grandeur. But note, it is a natural hill. It's not man-made. Only the stuff placed on top of the hill is <laughs> the archaeological site itself. Interestingly, this architectural style later echoes through the Samoan tradition of mound building around 1100 CE. This connection, while distance, hint at a broader culture exchange across the region. However, before diving deeper into these connections, it's important to note that the Hundenberendax theory is intertwined with regional pride and identity. Again, I like to stress that the hill is just an old volcano since long in deep slumber. The construction of the site clearly took advantage of this tall hill and the resources that could be found on top of it. Why work harder when you can work smarter? But that's it. From the archaeological evidence, this is the explanation that fits based on decades of excavation, including whatever Natavijaya and his emergency group did up there. And that's the issue too. We don't really know what they did, where they excavated, what's disturbed, what they moved and all of that. And we should always look at the evidence when making a conclusion, not try to fit our evidence into our predetermined narrative. Next time, we will end our Ancient Aliens Top 10 Pyramid series. If you have followed this exploration from the start, you know that this was number three on the list. Number two is the temple of uh, Borobudur, also here in Indonesia. And I will actually skip it because the whole argument boils down to... Buddha is depicted as sitting inside of these small stupas. But it looks like Buddha is flying a flying saucer at Borobudur. That's the obvious thing you think of when you see this. Yeah, sometimes we need to choose our battles and we will have time to return to this claim in a later episode. Again, since this is based on a compilation episode. Next time we meet, it is time to learn what pyramid occupies the number one spot on this list. And I hope to see you then. Again, please spread the word by leaving a positive review on platforms like iTunes, Spotify, or even better, recommend your favorite episode to a friend of yours. That's even more helpful. Recommend it to two friends, three friends. For more information about me and our podcast, you find all of that on diggingupancientaliens.com. You'll find an extensive list of sources and resources and reading recommendations for those eager to expand their knowledge on the subject matter on the episode page again on the website 
If you want to support the show, head over to patreon.com slash diggingupancientaliens. There you will get early and even extended episodes, bonus episode and my eternal thank you. If you don't like Patreon, I understand you. We have a membership solution too. You find all of that on the website and down in the links in the description. If you don't want to play favorites but still want to support good archaeological content, well, you can join the archaeologicalpodcastnetwork.com. And a membership there includes a good array of goodies too. If you want to contact me, it can be done through most social media sites. And if you have comments, corrections, suggestions, or just want to write that email in all caps, you find my contact info on the website. Sandra Martelor created intro music and our outro is by the amazing band called Trallskruv, who sings their song Foliehatt. Links to both of these artists can be found in show notes. Until next time, keep shoveling that science. Men jag skjuter